yeah so before we start um i just want to acknowledge the land on which i am joining from and i encourage you to do the same um and you can look up where you're joining from by going to native-land.ca um so i'm currently in jojage commonly known as montreal um, which is the unceded indigenous lands of the ganeagana mohawk nation um this nation is known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and we recognize um, the Ganangaha people as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be joining on, on these lands that have been protected for a millennia. And with that, um, I will pass it over to Hope. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so we're joined by two really exciting um, guests today. And so we have uh, Liz Benyon, who is a former journalist and newspaper editor with a degree in science, who has been leading environmental advocacy and educational organizations since 2004. Currently, Liz is executive director and manager of uh, environmental education for Ontario Green Conservation Association, a charity that is dedicated um, to providing environmental education programs to over 90,000 students Liz is also the founder of Biodiversity and Climate Action Niagara, a collective of 22 organizations that advocate for a better planning and policies to protect biodiversity and mitigate the climate crisis. She's also a founding member of the Alliance for a Livable Ontario. In recognition of her dedication to preserving and enhancing the environment, Liz has received local, provincial, and national awards. Um, so very lucky to have Liz. And we are also joined by Mark Freeman. And Mark is someone who holds a computer engineering degree as well as certifications in project management and process management. Mark has worked 25 years in a variety of management positions in IT and telecom companies before becoming increasingly aware of and engaged with the environmental movement within Canada, focusing on activities to address climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, so yeah, we gather here today to kind of reflect upon the um, the havoc that's gone on in Ontario over the last few months. Um, and Liz and Mark are going to speak about their experiences working on different Ontario-based campaigns um, regionally in, in Niagara, in that region, um, specifically on the Greenbelt and gas plants. And so uh, we'll pass it to Liz to begin uh, our, our talk. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so you heard a little bit about my history. I've been involved in advocacy, environmental advocacy work for uh, almost 20 years now. And uh, 15 years ago, we moved to Niagara. And I thought I was going to get a little break from some of the environmental advocacy work that I've been doing. But no, um, in Niagara, just as we have everywhere in Ontario, there's a lot of issues and especially around development and inaction on climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what I realized a few years ago were there were a lot of little groups around Niagara who were involved in the environment in one way or another, uh, but they weren't working together. And because they weren't working together, they didn't have any power. So one little issue would pop up and one little group would pop up to deal with that issue. And then none of the learning that they got from dealing with the issue was transferred to anybody else. And that issue would go away and, and you know, people would disappear from that group and, and it would all get lost. And so um, I really believe in the necessity of organizing because the things and the people that we are fighting against are organized and we need to be organized too. So one of the things that happened is I went to a, a meeting about native bees at Brock University. I went to a lecture and uh, at the end of the lecture, everyone started talking about you know, how terrible all these things were, and uh, this was bad, and that was bad, and this was the problem, that was the problem. And I'd been to a lot of those sessions before where people talked about the problems, but they never got to how can we fix it. So I stood up and said, look, we all know what the problems are. We also all know what the solutions are. And I think it's about time we started working together to get the solution. So if anyone's interested in sticking around after this lecture um, to talk to me about how we can get solutions, stick around. And so that was the, the very beginning of uh, biodiversity and climate action Niagara. So that was about, I don't know, maybe five years ago now. 
And what we did was we drew all these groups together. So now, as you heard, there's 22 groups that are part, I think I said that, maybe I didn't, 22 groups that are part of a better Niagara. And we have uh, about a hundred people who aren't associated with any other group, but they wanted to be part of our, the collective action that we took. So um, that's the group. And we started off, um, we, it, and, and I wanted it to be a broad-based group because again, too often groups start off up to fight one little issue in their own little area. And then something else will come up and they're, you know, friends of Richmond Pond and they're not ready to fight the green belt. So, so I believe in broad-based coalitions that can react to whatever is going on. And so that's what, that's what biodiversity and climate action um, was. And what I also wanted to do was I wanted to spawn new groups. So for people who aren't familiar with Niagara, we have a regional government but we are really 12 individual municipalities and each municipality is doing its own thing and each municipality um, really, they, they don't think of themselves as a united uh, region. They think of themselves as individual communities. And so I wanted to be able to um, start groups in some of those communities where there weren't groups. And in fact, that's happened. So we've been able to spawn new groups in Beamsville, new groups in Grimsby, uh, 50 by 30 Niagara, which you'll be hearing more about, started with a conversation between Herb and I. Uh, he's the founder of uh, 50 by 30. So a whole bunch of new groups have started, which again, add to our strength and add to our reach. So being organized and creating broad-based groups is one of the big things. The first thing that we uh, went after as a group was our region was creating a new official plan. And the official plan guides planning. And of course, you can't have a good environment unless you have good planning, because if we're going to sprawl, if we're going to build buildings that are inefficient, if we are, you know, all of these things, if we're going to build these uh, car dependent transportation systems. So environment and planning are absolutely linked together. So our region was creating a new official plan and they were looking at for the very first time developing a natural heritage system and, and what a natural heritage system is is identifying the key environmental features on the landscape, putting buffers of land around them to protect them from um, encroaching development, and then linking them together so that they form a strong enough ecological system that it can protect the biodiversity. Back in 2000 and, oh, I guess back, way back in 2000, as when I was still a newspaper editor, I started uh, writing about the fight to protect some land in North Oakville. And that fight ended up resulting in the very first natural heritage system that any municipality had ever created. And so it was a group that I became president of, which was called Oakville Green, which was the citizens group that fought for the creation of that natural heritage system. 29 developers went against the town of Oakville once we finally won the town over, because first it was the citizens fighting the town. And then after a couple of elections, and we had the right councillors in place, then the citizens could actually work with the councillors. And uh, so then it was us working together against the developers. 29 developers took the town to the Ontario Municipal Board to try and stop that um, natural heritage system and we prevailed. So that was a precedent setting decision that other municipalities um, could then adopt. So anyways, that was you know, years ago. And now here I am in Niagara and Niagara region for the first time ever is looking at creating a natural heritage system. The only problem was staff and many councillors didn't want the best option. Some councillors wanted the very bare minimum they could possibly get by with. And so we were determined to get them to adopt the very best of the, of the options. And to do that, we had to make a lot of delegations to council. We had and committees. We had to uh, meet with councillors. We had to do a lot of publicity uh, through our social media to get people activated and involved. Um, we did all kinds of hard work. And the bottom line is we got them to adopt unanimously um, the best natural heritage system. So we had a victory behind us. Our first big action, we won. And so we were prepared now for the next thing that came along, which was a natural heritage system. It was the green belt, natural heritage system actually writ large over the province. And so um, when, 
when uh, Ford said that he was going to, you know, allow development in the green belt, we were ready to take action. And we did a whole bunch of things. So I'm just going to outline some of the things we did. So we organized protests. I think we had seven or eight protests, including one during the worst snowstorm we had, which we still got more than 80 people to. Um, we um, said, and protests are great, but they're not, protests will not change policy. So protests are great for drawing public attention and getting media attention and uh, putting a little bit of heat on your local MPP, but they're not gonna change policy, but they're good to do for a whole bunch of other reasons. Plus, I found out, I didn't think that they would like it, but people liked it. <laughs> My people wanted to come out. They wanted to protest, they wanted to hold signs, they wanted to talk to each other, they wanted to see that there were other people who felt exactly like them. So for those bonding reasons and building the strength of the organization, protests are really good. Um, we also uh, became, I became the distributor for the hands off the green belt signs. So we were getting the signs from Guelph and I was distributing them uh, from my house to members out in the community. We, uh, we use social media really effectively to get messages out, both our own messages, but also supporting good journalism. So the Toronto Star was doing investigations, the Auditor General had a report, the Integrity, everything ev that we could find that was about this, we were putting out there and, and getting people to share. And we were also creating a lot of our own stuff using our own graphics, using our own headlines, using our, our getting our messages out. And things that we were doing started being shared by other groups around the province. So they had pretty big impact. Um, we also met with our local MPP for all the good it did us, but we met with him because you have to do it, <laughs> whether it's gonna be helpful or not, because you have to be able to say that you did it. And we also uh, sent him letters and um, you know, constantly in contact with him about the issue. Um, but we went beyond that and we met with the opposition leader. So we met with Merritt Stiles. Uh, we met with Sandy Shaw, who is the environment critic for the NDP. We wrote to the all the members of the NDP to urge them to, you know, fight this thing and, and uh, be a strong opposition. If we had particular things to say about particular issues, we wrote them. We also, um, we also wrote to the federal government and we wrote to the federal government to use every lever at their disposal to try and protect uh, Greenbelt lands. And that actually had an impact, believe it or not. We got a letter back from the prime minister's office in less than a week. It wasn't just a standard form letter reply. It was somebody in his office had actually read what we said and they copied Guibault, the minister of the environment uh, federally and, um, and made it clear that he was expected to respond. He did respond. And then when they announced that they were going to do the study on the on the uh, Duffins Rouge lands, I was invited to that press conference. So we know we reached them. Um, and so that was that was really important. Um, what else did we do? We we put a lot of emphasis on getting our people to take action and taking action means not talking about it among yourselves and not um, trying to convince people who are never gonna be convinced, but dealing with the decision makers. So people writing their own letters, people making their own phone calls. We also connected them with bigger group actions. So um, I'm kind of a conduit between the big provincial groups like Environmental Defense and Ontario Nature and our local community groups. And so anything that they were doing, we passed on to our group and we got them to take action on those things too. And then um, as well, Environmental Defense, um, the Greenbelt Alliance and a number of other groups, Ontario Nature, were talking about forming a big, broad, uh, multi-sector alliance that could deal not only with the Greenbelt over time, but a, a whole host of issues that were coming up uh, about good planning and creating livable communities and all of that. And so um, because I was involved with all these people in one way or another, I was a founding member of the Alliance for Livable Ontario. And so that alliance did a whole bunch of things too that we participated in, um, but they did things, uh, for instance, they countered the argument that uh, this land was needed for housing. 
very effectively. They did their own studies. They hosted seminars, seminars for the public and for municipal uh, counselors and staff. So we supported all that work and, and you know, we helped to create that organization as well. Okay, and then um, we, got our, we got our people to write to um, members of the PC party and take their own individual actions in a lot of ways. And the bottom line, as we all know, is that Ford finally under significant pressure and under the pressure of the AG's report and um, the integrity commissioner's report reversed uh, his stand. So that was great, it was wonderful. We all took a few days to savor it. And I told everybody, I don't wanna hear anything negative for a couple of days, but we all know that that's not the end of the story. <laughs> and we're already seeing that here in Niagara where land that is being put back in the green belt, we now have a municipal council who's asking for it to be taken out. So, so it's, it's not ended, but, the, the wonderful thing about having a big, broad organization that's now had some victories behind it, including the Thorold Gas Plant, which I know Mark is gonna talk about. Uh, so we've had three big victories in our little group. Um, now these people are ready. They're ready for whatever comes next. They're all moving. Once you get people moving, you can steer them in whatever direction need, they need to go, but you gotta get them moving. And so that's why creating these big, broad organizations that are flexible and that can pivot um, is really important if you want to be successful. And I'm going to shut up now. So, so if anybody has any questions, that was like 100 miles an hour. But if you have any questions or you want to talk about anything I said, please feel free. Thank you so much, Liz. That was incredible. And I'm so inspired. And I I'm going to email you after this because I just want to keep talking to you about everything that you spoke about. Um, yes, any any questions from, from anyone? One of the things I should mention to you just quickly is we worked really well with other groups that had started up. So for instance, Environment Hamilton or Stop Sprawl Hamilton or Stop Sprawl Durham. And I did a lot of work with those folks who were sort of my level around the province too helping and supporting each other um, and, and publicizing each other's stuff. Yeah, Janet, go ahead. Uh, so, hi, Liz. Um, you hi. had mentioned, you know, you the part of your success and your preference was, you know, working with, and you start off with a broad-based coalition. And so other groups, of course, are going to People will be interested. Some you mentioned didn't want to be part of a group, but they want to be part of a big effort. And then you had other small groups. So you have other groups that are starting up. How did they get attracted to your big, broad coalition? How did you link between a, how did you help them to link between a local issue and what you were dealing with overall? So um, I just, that's an interesting question. So, so I always try and make an effort if I see anybody kind of sticking their head above the parapet. <laughs> if I see that, I try and contact them. So um, that's usually how it gets started. I see somebody who made a comment or said something or identified an issue in their area and I'll contact them and I'll start talking to them and I'll say, well, you know, really, we don't have anybody in West Lincoln who, um, you know, can can do this stuff. Or I call them and say, oh, I read about that issue. You know, I know something about that. Can I help you with that? And it, so it's it's really personal. It's sort of one on one. I reach out to people and, you know, get a relationship going with them, help them any way I can and then teach them about how to get organized so that they can be effective. Um, a long time ago, back when I was fighting incinerators, I created a thing called Organizing to Win because I realized that you know, citizens were able to do their own research. They were able to find all the information we had about why incineration was bad, but what they didn't know how to do was be effective advocates. And so I took all the stuff that we had learned through all the big battles that we had, like we were the first municipality that got a municipal pesticide bylaw, just for example. There were so many things that we did and we learned from. 
And I just put all that into a package called Organize to Win and started teaching people how to be effective advocates. And so that's kind of what I'm doing in a sort of less organized way now. It's, you know, it's it's personal one-on-one, but uh, that's what really led to the groups being formed. And that drew them into us. Yeah, go ahead, Jake. Thank you. Um... Liz, uh, it's, it's so impressive. And I, I'm, uh, I've run into other people like you in the world, not many. Um, it's uh, such a, such a wonderful effort you, you make, I, I um, bringing people together and, and all that. And, and we, we need so much more of it. You know, I, um, I'm glad to hear that you've taught it or taught some of it. Um, do you, do you have a feeling that, um, Others have taken it up uh, from your teaching. Like, did you did you see success from that? I have seen success. Um, it, it wasn't just incinerators that uh, you know I help people with with that organized to win, <clears throat> and I have seen um, successes. So, just in, in terms of the incinerators, um, I helped groups in Meaford, Port Hope, uh, Six Nations, here in Niagara. Uh, Southwestern Ontario, none of those incinerators were built. All of them, all of them were killed. So I've seen that success. There was there was a, a bunch of other little things in little communities, but yes, I have seen it. But, but I'm talking more about the people that might have learned from you. Um, have, have you seen them go on? And, uh, do you know Margaret? Do you know Margaret Prophet? No, I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm in Ottawa and I'm not terribly well connected. I just started okay. showing up the things recently. So. so Margaret Prophet has been one of the people who's been sort of a key lead on the Greenbelt issue. Um, she's She's gone on to big things in the province uh, in terms of advocacy. Um, uh -huh. I first met her over a fight about development into a wetland in Midhurst. And she invited me to come up and do an organize to win for her group. Uh -huh. So that's one of one example uh -huh. but there's there's many i you know i think i just got to mention this because i know i got to go soon and i think this is important one of the key things that i found is that a lot of times groups get caught up in being perfect getting exactly the right thing wordsmithing stuff to death and it kills groups groups get into all kinds of nitty picky little arguments and all this and i i, I said we're not doing that so I happen to be a writer by profession. And so what I said with Biodiversity and Climate Action Niagara is, this is a coalition of the willing. When we identify an issue that we need to fight, I will manage the communications. I will write the letter. And then everybody, every group and every individual has a choice to sign on or not. Mm -hmm. There's no arguing, there's no wordsmithing, there's no back and forth 500 times, and by that time the issue is you know, already gone. No, we, we can take action quickly and people sign on or not. And you know what? They always sign on. <laughs> so, uh -huh. and, and then people get to trust you and they get to realize that you know, you know how to get things done and, and it's being effective. So I found little things that make managing these bigger, broader coalitions um, easier and and more effective. You know anyone in Ottawa who's um, taken on your skills or? No, and, and in fact, um, Ottawa was a place that had an incinerator that, that failed and lost a lot of money, Plasco, that was years ago. Right. And we were always trying to get a group going, a broader base, not just incineration, a broader based environmental group in Ottawa. It was a tough nut to crack because so many people are working for the government. Yeah. So many people didn't want to put their heads above the parapet. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, a, a person I'll mention is uh, Angela Keeler, Keller Herzog, who's, uh, he's, she's been a green candidate here in Ottawa and, uh, and is the, the chairperson of CAFE's, uh, community associations uh, for environmental sustainability, probably, I think. Um, uh, anyway, I'll just mention that. But um, 
anyway, I'll let you go. Thank you. Um, uh, it's fascinating to hear about that. If you know a few people, let me know. If people you know a few people, let me know. We'll get something organized. Okay, so you would still do it? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Liz, and um, we'll be sure to share, if this is okay, your your contact info so that folks here can can reach out and and yeah, let you know if anyone needs to have an organized to win presentation. Maybe we'll invite you back on another call to, specifically to do an organized to win session. I think that's that's exactly something um, that we would be really excited to have you back for. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. I'm sorry, I have to run. I all Mark. Good. Have fun. <laughs> okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Thank bye. you. Okay, and now on to Mark. And so um, I'm going to try to share my screen because I know I have those slides, but because I'm recording, if it doesn't work, I'm going to pause it to make Alina because I know that sometimes um, computers are picky about what they want to share at any time. Um, so let me give this a go. Can you all see this okay? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can full screen it so that it's a little bit um, nicer. Okay. Perfect. Great, just let me know when you want me to, to go to the next one. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's just, I've been in, you know, industry for so long. I just, I can't talk without slide deck, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just the way uh, it's been for so many uh, years. So yeah, I'm here to talk about the uh, proposed thorough gas plant. Um, this was part of the uh, Ontario government through the ISO uh, to build, uh, expand a number of gas plants, but also build half a dozen new ones across Ontario to meet our energy needs. And when I found out that one was in Thorold, where I live, I jumped on the opportunity because there's so many times that uh, I, I attend a lot of rallies. I, I support a lot of groups, uh, environmental groups, local as well as, as uh, provincial or, or national. But it's not very often that you really get a chance to do something specific in your neighborhood. And so this one I jumped on. And... Um, as the notes say here, as as we probably all know, this this um, uh, plan that the Ontario government has for for energy for their short term, um, it, it's going to cost billions of dollars, and it will increase our um, gas power generation from four percent from back in twenty seventeen to almost to a, a quarter of what we what we'll be generating in just a couple of decades, and along with that, of course, is greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse gases will explode and they will be 700 times uh, what they are in 2017, what they were in 2017, if we allow this to go on. Um, there's a number of reasons, climate change, obviously, which is at the forefront of my mind, but um, we also need to look at ways to motivate our, our politicians. Uh, they don't always hear climate change. What they hear is business, business, business. So um, this is, you know, uh, increasing our power generation and our and, and our emissions by this amount is going to make it very difficult for Ontario to attract new business. Look at the 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 two big announcements were both battery plants, and they're coming here along with a number of other businesses. They're coming to Ontario because we have clean energy. Um, it's not going to be clean energy if we continue down this sort of path. Um, it also increases the cost of living for Ontarians as um, renewable energies are now cheaper than burning fossil fuels. So there's there's so many reasons uh, that this was wrong uh, and taking us in the wrong direction um, when we're trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40, 50%. And uh, the federal government is coming out with um, uh, plans to decarbonize the electricity grid. This is just so far in the wrong direction. So it seemed obvious that this had to be uh, had to be stopped. Next, lot, next slide, please, Hope. Thanks. So I, I knew I couldn't do anything by myself. Um, I'm fairly new in the Niagara region. And just over last year or two, I had joined two local groups, 50 by 30 Niagara. Um, unfortunately, Herb couldn't be here tonight. 
and Liz and her group, Biodiversity and Climate Action Collective Niagara. So I went to them and said, we have to fight this gas plant. And they basically said, yes, and you're the one in Thorold, go for it. <laughs> but they're here to support and, and do what they can. So they really raised a lot of awareness within the community, um, which is what we need. We need to have, um, I don't want to use the word pressure, but we need our city councillors to understand where the people stand on these types of issues. So that's what they did uh, amazingly. Um, I also reached out to a number of uh, other larger groups that I knew who were already fighting the plan that Ontario had. Um, three groups stepped up and responded to me right away, Ontario Clean Air Alliance, and they've been, they were incredible. They, they really took a leadership role, providing the materials we needed, all the information we needed in order to, uh, to fight the fight. Uh, environmental defense as well, um, and the Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign. They had some, they had some really niche information too that we uh, we used as part of our campaign uh, against the gas plant. So once these groups were all in place and we're all agreeing to support, um, then we came up with a plan to um, just raise the visibility. And so we did that with uh, some articles published in the in the paper. Uh, uh, Herb from 50 by 30, uh, Liz, as well as myself, we got articles posted, um, sorry, published. Um, uh, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance provided us with flyers that we distributed in the area to make sure everyone is aware of it. Uh, they also placed ads along with environmental defense in uh, local uh, newspapers, as well as on Facebook. So this had a lot of attention, brought a lot of attention to what was going on. Uh, next slide, please. So we did raise the visibility. Uh, we were successful in raising the visibility. Um, so there were hundreds of letters written to city council. Uh, I know that there was over 200 written because Just Ontario Clean Air Alliance alone had 210, 220. Um, they, had a, they had a sign up like a, you know, a form letter online. So people didn't have to write their own. They just went in and, uh, and put their name on it and that sent a letter. So they did over 200. Liz wrote an amazing letter, uh, one of her sign-on letters that she referred to. So she had um, over 100 signatures on that one. And um, I don't know exactly who wrote or called city councillors, but I know they did because people were coming up to me and saying, oh, I called our councillor. I told him oppose this. Um, so it was, it was really great, great action that we had from, from the community. So Thorold City Council initially had, um, they were going to, review this project as one of their regular review meetings, uh, what one of the regular council, council meetings, and they realized that there was so much attention that they actually postponed it twice and then ended up setting up a, a special meeting just to talk about this. And uh, we had good attendance. Uh, the local media was there, um, which was eventually picked up by Toronto Star and Hamilton Spec and others. Um, at the meeting itself, Northland, uh, they're the, uh, the company that was presenting uh, the proposal to build a, a gas plant. They already have one in Thorold. So they were going to build another one right next to it, um, which is interesting to know that their existing one is barely used and they're going to go and build another one. Uh, they had two local businesses support them uh, talking about uh, renewable natural gas. And unless you have questions, I'm not going to get into that because that takes us down a whole nother path. Um, but uh, it was interesting. But uh, then, then it was our time, or it was our turn to speak. And um, Jack, uh, the founder of Ontario Clean Air Alliance, uh, or the head, uh, he spoke uh, really well about why we shouldn't be building this this uh, gas plant. Uh, myself and and three other residents also spoke uh, at the council meeting, and we really focused our our conversation around uh, climate change, around the local air pollution and the health issues for, for, for local people and uh, the financial uh, concerns. Uh, like I mentioned earlier that we're trying to attract people to the Niagara region. Um, if you know the history of Niagara, a couple of decades ago, um, there was a huge industrial boom in Niagara region because of all the clean energy from the hydro, right? Uh, since then, they've all, most of them have left but um, but there's a history of clean energy there, so we don't want to lose that. Um, after we spoke, 
it was really good to see that uh, three councillors um, spoke about climate change and how concerned they are. And this is really good to hear. And um, everyone spoke. There's actually, and I, I want to raise this, um, there was two of the councillors who are known climate deniers. Um, I've had a run in with them uh, earlier this year when we we're, as Liz was talking about the official plan, I was um, sending some emails uh, on what I expected in the content of the uh, official plan and was, was stressing biodiversity and, and climate change. And two councillors wrote me back and um, I won't get into the details, but it, it wasn't pretty what they had to say. So it was amazing that at the end of the day, uh, Thorold City Council, including the mayor, voted unanimously to um, not endorse the project. That's how you have to say it, because they were coming, Northland was coming for approval and they did not receive it. Um, what else? Um, the main, the main, um, yeah, I want to talk about a couple things here. The, when the residents were speaking, um, myself and one other resident, we had, and, and um, Terra Cleaner Alliance, we have sort of generic comments to make um, that everybody should know, but we know that everybody doesn't. But the two that really stood out that the councillors, I think, really um, were drawn to, one was uh, somebody who lives in Thorold, who is an engineer and works in the energy industry. So he was seen as a technical expert. And um, I think that people really believed what he had to say. And then the other person, which is the only one that showed up that I hadn't arranged to show up. I saw somebody sitting there. I didn't know who he was. And he was a resident that lived right next to the, the existing gas plant. He was amazing. He he had this impassioned speech about the pollution that coming out of the existing plant, that they can see it during the day. And he said they can feel it falling on them when they're out walking at night. And it's like all the councillors were really moved by that. So when it comes to getting councillors attention, technical experts and local people that can really, you know, make you feel what's going on were extremely valuable. That said, this vote was pretty much already won before the council did. Okay. We knew that we had four or five of the councillors on our side, and we were hopeful that the others were as well. So, and that's what happened um, because I had been calling them and saying, So, if you have any questions, let me know <laughs> after we wrote our letters, right? Uh, so, anyways, the, the message to the Ontario government uh, and the ISO is basically we're looking for Ontario to find a better way to meet our energy needs. And we know it's possible. Next slide, please. Right, so I mentioned that we really focused on three different areas when we did our uh, campaigning, whether it be letter writing, phoning, as well as at the meeting itself. We talked about climate change um, and uh, the need to stop expansion of, of our greenhouse gas emissions. It just keeps going up and up in Canada. Ontario's no no exception. Um, we talked about local air pollution. Even the people that don't understand climate change or don't agree with climate change, everyone understands air pollution. So we spent some time talking about the black carbon and and uh, the other negative side effects of the of the air pollution, the health effects that are documented and known. Uh, we spent time talking about that, and then we talked about the the economic piece and how we can provide Ontario, uh, electricity in Ontario by, by um, um, shifting electricity demand, um, by obviously investing more in renewables. Uh, the Ontario government, when they came in, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, they canceled over 700 renewable energy projects, uh, which is, didn't help. Um, and um, um, I think we we sort of put pressure on the Ontario government as well, not just us, but other groups and other initiatives where they finally reneged on what they said they were going to do with Quebec. And they finally went and signed a new agreement with Quebec to, to secure hydropower from Quebec, which is a great thing. And they had canceled it when they first came into power. So um, that's, um, that's pretty much where we focused our, our efforts. Uh, what I personally learned from this experience is that... Uh, I'm fairly new to the whole um, uh, advocacy and and environmental movement. 
And what I learned pretty quickly is that I'm not alone, alone in wanting to do something to mitigate climate change. And when we connect with other people, as Liz, is, Liz, Liz was saying, uh, local groups, provincial groups, and I want to learn more about, uh, about you folks, um, we can get something to happen. And, if, and Liz talked a lot about the bigger picture, uh, and I do get the bigger picture, but as you had mentioned at the very beginning, Hope, my background is in project management, and I like specific, tangible projects where we know what we need to do and uh, we can take action to do that. So right now what we're looking at, and I think it's gonna be on the next discussion that you wanna talk about is, is how do we stop Ontario's, the way I look at it is how do we stop uh, fossil gas expansion in Ontario? It just keeps going on and on. We have to stop the bleeding. So um, I can talk to that when you, when you want me to as well, okay? So that's it, unless there's any questions. Yeah, so I had some backup slides if you wanted to see. Yeah, you know, we highlighted some climate change issues. We talked about, oh yeah, just keep this slide up for a second. So one, uh, sorry, no, the uh, the next one or the one back, I guess. Uh, go back a couple, if you don't mind. That one. So one of the things that I wanted to raise at city council and I put in my letter to city council as well as spoke to it, is I wanna plant some seeds that uh, will help the next initiative that we do. I, I believe, now you may, you may say this isn't true because we've seen the polls and the surveys that says 70% you know, of Canadians wanna do something about climate change. Personally, I, I don't believe that Canadians really understand how responsible Canada is for causing climate change. So I wanted to start planting those seeds. If you look at the stats, um, some people will say, oh, we're not even responsible. It's you know one and a half or 2% of global emissions. Well, yes, but even if we're 2% of global emissions, we're still in the top 10. And I think everyone would agree that at least the top 10 countries have to do something about climate change. But it's even worse than that because that 2% doesn't count all the emissions that we export. We're the fourth largest oil producer in Canada, uh, sorry, in the world, and we export 80% of our oil. That doesn't count in that one and a half or 2% number. If we counted that all that oil that's exported, we've got to be in the top five, including countries in the world. And in terms of our record over the past few decades, it's horrible. If you look at us compared to other G7, G20 countries, um, that have all made a commitment to reduce emissions, we're the only one that have it. We've gone up by 20%, while the UK as an example, which is where it all started with the industrial revolution, they've gone, they've managed to reduce their emissions by 40%. And you know, Europe's industrial powerhouse, Germany, have reduced theirs by 35%. So what are we doing? So we we I, I you know, I just want people to all be aware that we are responsible and need to take action and need to push our, our politicians to do so. Sorry, you got me going, I'm on my soapbox. Okay, I'm off. Mikkel no, this is what you're here for. I, I think it's great what you're saying and, and thank you again for, for all of, um, for, for your presentation. Uh, I also will be getting in touch with you afterwards, I feel, to, sure. to chat more. Um, but uh, yeah, before, before but anyone else have questions off the top of their heads? I think Michalina did. Um, yeah, well, it's, I'm just really impressed, honestly. Like, I remember when I was organizing in 2021, I'm not sure how much was going on then, but I guess maybe I, I didn't know about the organizing that was occurring, and it was really hard to get people out um, mm -hmm. to the climate strikes because it was, like, right after the pandemic, and people were still, you know, kind of skeptical about being in large groups, and there was a lot um, of, of that kind of, you know, concern, which is completely valid. And, and so organizing was really hard. So it's just so, 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 so amazing to see all the amazing work that's being done in Niagara. I'm so inspired. I'm going to tell all of my friends in Niagara. <laughs> and it's just really great. So thank you for, for everything that you do. You're welcome. And tell them to join uh, Liz's Biodiversity and Climate Action Network, as well as Herb's uh, 50 by 30, because that's how we make things happen. We had a lot of volunteers that you know, uh, once I said, hey, we need to do 
this, they just jumped on it. So it was, it was great. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like um, I'm also incredibly inspired. And I think it actually makes me think about what what is possible when um, when there is a group of people who is activated, as Liz said, like once you have the, the people, the ranks ready, you know, you can kind of direct them to, to wherever they may need to be. Um, and it's making me think a little bit about the places where it's not so easy to get those ranks activated and, and where there actually isn't a base that you can draw upon for uh so I'm I grew up near um I grew up in Essex County which is um near Windsor mm -hmm. um and I know that Windsor was one of the first gas plants in this new revitalizing gas plants business to to be passed and and a lot of people said that strategically the province did like try to pass Windsor first because they knew that there wouldn't be a lot of resistance um, compared to the rest of the the province and, and all the other um, potential locations. Um, and I know the folks on the ground who were like, you know, fighting hard as they could at council, but it was really only a group of like five of them. Um, and they just, they were, they were kind of ambushed, essentially. Um, and, and they didn't have the support they needed, like the one that you're describing that Liz has kind of created this like dark, large coalition, they didn't have that um, kind of that base to be able to draw upon during that that quick moment, um, and so I I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on and reflections on on how to kind of get that prepared. Well, I think we were fortunate though because when Ontario first came out with the announcement that they wanted to increase uh, gas plants, um, they didn't give the choice. I I'm not sure where Windsor falls, but I know Toronto as an example. They weren't given the choice. And there was pushback, so they came out and said, "I think they totally misread the 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 um, the, the people." Okay, they they really misread it because they came out and said, "Okay, the municipality has to agree before we go forward with any more gas plants." And well, guess what? Thank you very much. You just gave us our ticket because the municipality we can convince not to. We have a hard time dealing with the ISO and with the Ontario government. Obviously, I've sent them tons of letters, never a response. Um, so, so like Toronto have voted against it three times now. Um, but the thing is running. And just one more comment, just uh, on the on these. There's supposed to be a peaker plant in Toronto and a peaker plant in 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 uh, Thorold, which are only supposed to be used less than five percent of the time. And the, if you saw the Toronto Star article, right? So in Toronto, they've been running that one 21 hours a day through the summer. So, I mean, it's horrible. So anyways. Yeah, so but, much for the, the peaker name. Yeah, and, and because I spoke with, I spoke with Northland Power, um, they're local and, and I, I met with them a couple of times myself to understand what they were doing. And they explained the difference between a capacity uh, plant and a peaker plant. And the capacity plants are built for efficiency. The peaker plants aren't. So not only are we are we um, doing uh, is the government doing what they said they're not doing, but they're using a really inefficient way, which causes much more pollution. So it's crazy. It's it's anyways. <laughs> so yeah, what what I what we need to see next though is is um, um, Niagara region is having a climate change summit meeting next week uh the 25th and um the regional council councillors are invited to that and so we're going to the to the regional councillors and and tr again planting seeds and saying we need this community energy plan which is going to be talking about renewable energy which is going to be talking about lowering emissions which is going to be talking about using district energy and heat pumps, um, and that's going to be our path to get put a stop to the 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 constant growth of and expansion of Enbridge fossil gas network. We we need something tangible, and this is it in Niagara, and hopefully it's it exists in other areas across Ontario um, and Canada. You need something tangible to stop the gas expansions. So. This one's going to take a lot longer, though. It'll take uh, probably a year or two. 
Yeah, this just reminds me of like, like, cause you, you mentioned having like the information and planting those seeds in a sense. Um, we, at Climate Reality, we have a project called the National Climate League um where you essentially collect i'm not sure if you've ever heard of it but you collect like um in data well volunteers across canada collect data on indicators um related to sustainability whether that's urban greenness um renewable energy um yeah <laughs> the shameless plug right there um and, and then essentially what we do is we take it and we rank the cities across canada based on size so then you can use it as a lobbying tool in your municipality to say you know like we ranked really low on air air quality, um, but you know this town is doing really great, and this is how we can kind of implement those types of things to improve our air quality overall. Um, so it becomes a really good lobbying tool. Um, I'll send the link in the chat if you're interested. Um, even just I've, to know. I, yeah, I I looked at it once. Hope uh, contacted me. Okay. I went to your site and I found it, and I went through that. I recognized it as soon as Janet put it up. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I did go through that. Yes. Yeah, I'd, so like to see, I'd like to see the link. Yeah, it's in the chat right there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Otto, Ottawa's there, but Niagara's not yet there. I saw and that. And so, yeah, so there's a big invitation, and it's really the time to get involved because it is about data gathering now, and then they go through quality control, and then you get to be part of, you know, anybody. You know, there's different, all kinds of people, right? You don't have to have the, you learn by doing with the team, you meet people from other cities, um, and uh, and then they get involved with the launch. Right. And uh, there, there are videos and municipalities of municipalities who have used this process, right? That citizens have used the process really to, you know, get uh, have their city councilors uh, educated on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did see that as well on the website about municipal. Um council type of uh, presentation so that's definitely something um again specific to what we're doing in niagara right now is um i did my own research which people can do but you know what is a what is a community energy plan what are the benefits uh of it um that's and if it comes like i said earlier if it comes from a technical expert then you know i think they believe that better than me you know uh, I have an engineering degree, but not in this. So um, they, you know, I can send them my notes, which I do. But if it comes from a technical expert, uh, I think that really, really helps sway the the counselors. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'm just curious: Have you guys worked with the Niagara Adapts at all? I'm not sure how active they still are, but um, essentially, um, Dr. Jessica Blythe was running the program when I was in my master's program there, because sorry for the sirens in the background, but I did uh, my master's of sustainability at Brock and um, they were doing a program on like creating adaptation plans for the region, like collectively, um, instead of like their own, like each region, each sorry municipality having their own adaptation plan, because obviously it'll kind of affect all of the regions in the area. Um, and so it could be interesting considering they're they're obviously focused on well one research but um, also like biodiversity and adaptation and conservation so uh, I'm going to uh, ask Liz about it uh, as she mentioned she kind of pulls together a couple of dozen different groups in the region maybe that's one of them I don't know yeah uh, but the, the 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 organizational that's pulling together the summit um, uh, what are they called the Niagara uh, anyways they, they're it's NCCAN and they're composed of the Niagara Region government body, plus um, uh, Brock University, oh, awesome. Ni Niagara College, and the Niagara um, uh, Conservation uh, Group. Uh, I'm not sure which one. So they're the 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 main groups that are going to be driving this. So maybe Niagara adapts and somehow yeah. tied in. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a part of Brock, so I'm assuming they would be tied in. Considering okay. But I still, I'll still check though because uh, we're always looking to, to bring more teams and and groups in. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Janet, go ahead. So I'm wondering, you know, given the time of year and the conference of the parties of climate change, right? That's happening. Um, yeah, in a month or so. Uh, those are. Are you aware of anybody in Niagara who's part of a team? be it business, not-for-profit, or a municipality who's been given the kind of okay to attend? 
to, to and attend what messages with? are they going with? Sorry, to attend what? The Conference of the Parties, the annual climate change conference. And this one is happening in Saudi. Yeah, it's a large like international conference on climate change where all of the delegates of each of the countries go and discuss kind of their targets on climate change, where they're like their progress on um, reducing emissions. Um, and that's happening, I think, I believe, I believe it starts November 28th to the 12th of December. Um, and it'll be in Dubai, as, as um, Janet mentioned. Oh, you're talking about the, the COP. Yeah, the COP. Yeah, Conference oh, okay, of the okay, Parties, sorry. the COP. Just... Yeah. Okay, now I get it, yeah. Um, hmm. Because delegates, right, a small percentage are actually government delegates and they're, you know, chosen, but the rest of them are, you know, business representatives, not-for-profit representatives, um, industrial representatives, oil and gas, um, yeah. energy, um, so all of the sectors. And most of these sectors <clears throat> uh, receive funding from the government to send representatives and they go with their mandates. So what mandates are these sectors going with? You know, and what um, influence can Niagara bring to bear? Like who's going, right? Like if you just start asking that question, who's going from our region? Interesting, okay. I'll look into that. Um, I, I'd love to ask you a quick question based on what you were just saying about the, the the advantage of having a technical aspect or like a technical expert um, speaking at council. And I wonder if you think that's a similar technique that will help win over people to like there's everyday people coming to the cause or if it's actually more useful for um, someone who isn't necessarily the expert, but knows how to communicate those those facts to people in like a bit more of a, a conversational way. Like how how has your like how have you and how has your group gone about trying to um, convince everyday people to the cause rather than convince the counselors? Like how do you approach those two different audiences? Yeah, so so that's a really good question. Um... It's one that I struggle with all the time, uh, because if you look at the general public, I think most people are too busy, um, you know, with their career and their lives to 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 fully appreciate what's going on. Uh, uh, that was certainly me up until 10 years ago. Um, how to reach those people, I, ha I don't know. Uh, uh, what I think is important is once we have an initiative, we have to understand who the decision makers are and and if it's city council or if it's the province or if it's federal and, and then use whatever means we can to convince them. Um, but your your question, though, is really targeting the bigger question of how do we get more people in Canada engaged? And that's something that I'm constantly struggling with. Um, I, I think that there needs to be some sort of you know, real simple mass communication, but it'll take a ton of money uh, for advertising and 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 uh, things like that to get the word out because we're 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 facing a huge machine in the media, um, and and I don't want to say the right wing media, uh, but it's the media that is influence influencing most people, and as well as political parties, but for the most part, the media. And how do you combat them? It, it, it will take advertising and, and massive amounts of it. Totally. I mean, yeah, sorry to shuck no. that question onto you. I feel like I asked that because I I also would be curious for the answer. And so I'm I'm also constantly asking myself that. But yeah, you're right. Um, we'll see. I know there's a lot of... Um, so what's really exciting for, for me and Michalina is that we work nationally and so we get to see a bit more of what happens in different provinces and different municipalities and um, seeing like what strategies land better maybe and what strategies you know don't work as well in certain areas. Um, and it seems like in BC there, there actually is a, a bit more of, I don't know necessarily who's funding them, but there is a uh, there is some funding going on to um, really advertise uh 
the cons of of liquefied natural gas especially in homes um right. like in L- lng um new projects and, and a lot of bc um is is working to just generally decarbonize new builds and so there's been um really great ad campaigns um around vancouver i think but probably less so in the other areas but like vancouver in terms of like bus um uh, bus stops and, and and transit and stuff like that where um they actually connect like um lng projects with the forest fires that they've just experienced you know they really paint stark pictures of of consequences um which i think is really interesting and i wonder if you know there's i don't know i don't know how studies work necessarily on like effectiveness of ads but i wonder if we'll get any sort of data after um after those rounds of ads went out this summer to see if it's helped shift or at least bring awareness to the public opinion or even just give a bit more of a uh a seat at the table in advertising that the environmental um movement just doesn't really have as much uh skin in the game there right and i use the word advertising but really it's education right yeah and and ideally the education should be coming through the schools um although it's almost too late uh we need to get the general public to understand things but really i mean even if you look at um, uh, economics courses in school. They teach you about economics the way that capitalism wants us to understand economics. They don't talk about the downsides of overconsumption. They don't talk, and maybe, maybe they do in some university courses, but I, I, I doubt it. Um, so education needs to be rebalanced so that there's a, there's a climate change and biodiversity perspective on everything economics is the is the obvious one um because we can't just keep teaching people that um more is better that you know we just you know sales always have to go up revenues always have to go up um and we continue to to pull resources from from earth as if they're unlimited right so that sort of rebalancing needs to happen from an education perspective but from i'm just saying from an advertising perspective Canadians need to understand that we are accountable, that we can make a difference in the world. Um, and, and it's pretty simple on how to do it. it, it you know, and we see the government of Canada, they come out with an ad on wetlands. It's like, wow, that's, that's interesting. But you're sort of missing the whole front end of the message of how did we get here and how do we solve the problem? So. Totally. I think, and then I think stories like yours of of real successes are so key to that education message because I think a lot of people, especially if they are um, new to learning all of this, is it's so overwhelming, right? And so I think having those success stories to to boost people's confidence that yeah, as you said, we can do this. Like it's not the solutions are out there. We know what to do. We just need to do it. And so I think having your story of a success is is so crucial agreed because you know myself i mean i was getting pretty depressed as the year went on right um when you look at the fires and you look at all the 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 government actions that are going on it's extremely depressing so when you see in ontario we did had our little victory and that's going to help other towns now and then we see the green belt reversal yeah people make a difference so let's keep the momentum going right 